So you don't need a huge volume of content. You need strategic content. You need content that sells, content that attracts, and then you can create content for systems like for a, an article that you know a lot of people, link builders are going to link to and stuff like this so that you raise rankings. So it's about yep. being strategic in it and understanding that you don't have to churn out a lot straight away. After that, um, you you realize that you can spend five times as long on an article and get it better because yep. I always see it, this is what blew my mind. So like the direct response world, the paid ad world, guys will run an advert to cold audiences to a sales page and make a sale at a profit. And so they just do that all day. And it works because of the psychology of the page and the ad. Yep. It, it pulls them down, it gets a conversion. But they don't create assets. Whereas like the content guys, they wanna create assets and they don't wanna sell or do ads. I took the principles that we would do for a sales page and I put it into content. The psychology of why it works and how to pull people in and things like this. Welcome to Show Me The Nuggets, where each week, Doe chats with world-class entrepreneurs to find out the key principles, strategies, and processes that lie behind their outstanding achievements. Now, your host, the no-bullshit serial entrepreneur, Joe Troyer. Hey, everybody. It's Joe Troyer from Digital Triggers and Show Me The Nuggets. And today, I have on, as usual, a very special guest, uh, Daniel Danes Hutt. And folks, I am excited for today. Been really reading up on Daniel and his achievements. And I think that um, I think that what we've been talking a lot about is content. We've obviously been talking a lot about retargeting as of late and kind of these pre-working pre, -can, pre campaigns that we know are just going to win if we can kind of execute. And I think that today is going to be a kind of the culmination of all of that. So I'm super excited to have Daniel on the line. For those of you guys that don't know Daniel, Daniel is the founder of the Inbound Ascension uh, Retargeting and Sales uh, Psychology and also runs a content marketing and, and promotion service called Ant My Content. So Daniel, man, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate it. Awesome, man. So... When it comes to content marketing, you, that's kind of where you guys bear your name, right? And that's some really impressive accomplishment. So uh, I don't usually let people toot their horn this early in the interview, but we talk about some of your background when it comes to like inbound.org and some of your, your accomplishments there. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of crazy because I'm traditionally a paid ads guy. Yep. And when I started writing guides about paid ads, and they ended up being like some of the best performing of all time. So um, I wrote a case study about a retargeting campaign. I worked with someone and um, it ended up being in the top 10 of all time on inbound.org. Um, yep. It actually drove $3 million in client requests in two weeks. What else? We've been the top content on growth hackers for two years in a row. Wow. Um, we've had content shared by the CEO of Microsoft. Uh, on TechCrunch, Hacker News, Ryan Dice, Neil Patel, Susan Patel, Joanna Wee, all these kind of people. So um, yeah, we're very lucky, basically. 100%. So I wanna dive really deep on both content marketing and promotion, creating assets, um, and, and also then the retargeting side. But before we, before we go super deep and you start showing us all your nuggets, uh, it would be a really great, Daniel, if you give us a little bit of background on what happened before you broke out into the, this successful role. It's a crazy story. So I'm I'm an English guy and I'm in New Zealand right now. I literally, I'm, I'm in my basement. I can see there's palm trees just outside the window. I fell in love with the country and I was too old to apply for visas. And I found a loophole where I could get an entrepreneurship visa. And I, I was working at a surf shop and I saw like an opportunity for like um, kind of like sur uh, tourist surf clothing and stuff. So I designed t-shirts. It went like crazy. We we're in five retail stores in five weeks, uh, something ridiculous. And then um, I got to quit my job and then I was just like, well, what do I do with my time now? So I started to learn SEO and content. I did okay. Like um the content wasn't performing that great. And it wasn't until I started to learn about direct response and the psychology of why people do things that it actually really took off. Because I remember spending about 80, 80 hours on an article the once and it was like, it was designed to sell people and it had, 
it had a built-in calculator so that you could figure out if it was worth doing PPC or SEO and you could figure out the ROI and like run it five years in advance and all this other stuff and it got like two shares and one was me on Google Plus and then the other was my nan because I think she felt sorry for me uh, she's hilarious um, she'd like comment on Facebook ads and stuff if she sees the ads because she likes like the business so yeah I got into that and the content wasn't doing great and then I found direct response and I wrote uh, a couple of guides and then I wrote that case study and then everything took off after that. Um, I've only written like eight blog posts in the last three years maybe, you know, and yet it generates traffic, sales, all kinds of good stuff. We get ridiculously good opt-in rates. Like we have one article now that has an 83% opt-in rate, which is just insane, you know. Um, because of that, we run paid traffic to content as well. So for every dollar I spend promoting a particular article, I make $22 back. So like we're scaling that up and things. But yeah, it, uh, it was a journey with a lot of mistakes and road bumps and things. Um, I actually did, a, I set myself down. I don't know if you've ever heard, but it kind of takes like 66 days to form a habit. Yep. And so um, I decided that I was gonna do like the one big scary thing for my business, 66 days in a row. And by like day 15 or whatever, the case study went insane. Because I was just doing the things and I was like, okay, I'm gonna write, I, I approached, uh, someone approached me who ran this uh, this big e-commerce company and they wanted us to do ads. And I was like, okay, I'll do it for free if you let me write it up. So that was like day two. Then I wrote it up, reached out to some influencers at Inbound by, you know, by day seven, it was live on there. They'd shared it without me knowing. By day 14, we'd had like 300 client requests at 10 grand a pop. And I was just like, boom, because it was only me and an intern. And all of a sudden we had like, what was 3 million in client requests and all this other stuff coming through. And yeah, it just got, it got crazy pretty fast when you start focusing on the one next thing you need to do. Yeah, man, it's a, it's a crazy story. I've got so many crazy things that have happened, you know, but yeah. Yeah, man, that's awesome. And I can't wait to dive into uh, dive into it and really break it apart. Um, and so you got kind of two two brands or two companies. So you have Ant My yes. Content, right? And then Inbound Ascension. Can you talk a little bit about both of those, what they are, what they do, and when they came along, just for context? Okay, so um, so we have the retargeting blog, and it does really well. And I was I'm writing content for it, but the content is doing better than like huge content agencies. You know, like we're um ranking next to Mars and Backlinko and Neil Patel and stuff for this for this content. And um, I can't really talk about content marketing on a retargeting blog that much. Yeah. And so I decided to create Amp My Content. And the idea is we talk about all the content promotion side. So no one really talks about it. If they do, it's like massive list posts of like these are different methods. But no one was going into like uh, depth about these different things and so I think it's a massive channel because people don't realize it's like content marketing is two parts the content asset and then marketing the asset will actually get it off the ground and my partner Freya who is a classic content marketer like super introverted trying to get her in front of a camera on a podcast she took a SaaS company from 30,000 visits a month to 200,000 in eight months nine months something ridiculous is worth you know multiple millions per year in, in revenue so she's on the content side. So I wanted to create something with her just in case anything happened to me in the future. She has yep. this business that is around her skill set and she is like the co-founder of and, and it goes from there. So they work together in that one of them drives traffic and the other one get, teaches you how to get more sales. Right now we're focusing on AMP more than anything else just because I want to build that up. It is a flywheel. Right now it makes sales on automation but we can scale it up now. So I'm just focusing on there until we get to certain revenue goals. And then I'll kind of like, you know, bounce back between the two. All right, fantastic, good. Um, so that makes sense. Ultimately, when looking at content marketing, you've been able to achieve some crazy things, right? Um, with eight blog posts, you said, in the last how long? Yeah. Uh, two, three years, maybe. So this I haven't is something... released a blog post in 10 months. And, uh, I've just been link building and things and we went from DR zero to like DR 40 in like four months, maybe yeah. it's, it's just crazy.
at the end of last year, I sold and exited two of the companies that I was in. And so um, while this is happening, I'm kind of handcuffed, like working through due diligence and working through leaving and exiting and ultimately trying to figure out where the heck my, my, uh, my business was gonna go. And the cool thing was, is that I had negotiated that I was going to keep the customer base and the email list as well. So I could continue to email them, which was great. So it was like, look, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to at least start creating content. And I knew that for me, um, I got to like, I got to, uh, I got to do something for 66 days to get the habit. And I can't take days off. Like it's mm -hmm. every day or it's not going to happen. It's every week if it's weekly or it's not going to happen. And then I got to stand up and I got to like, I got to proclaim it so that my customers call me out if I don't do it. And I just have no option. That's the only way that I will get shit done. Uh, and I know that about myself. So I was like, look, at the end of the day, I built two really successful businesses, um, all serving the same market. Uh, but at the end of the day, content marketing, I've never been great at, right? It's like, hey, we came out with a new promo. Boom, like, I know how to sell. I know how to get the marketing done. But the content side of it for me has always been a weak point. So I just decided like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail content. I'm really gonna work on content this year. And at least that's what I can do while I'm working the transition. So I got really good at pumping out a lot of content. We were doing daily content for the entire last year. Um, and now we've kind of moved it back and my concentration has really been very timely for this conversation, right? Really focusing on quality instead of quantity. So being a, a, a habitual content creator, what advice would you give somebody like me, Daniel, about what it takes to create a really good piece of content and where my mind needs to shift to? So you don't need to be creating a high volume all the time. From an SEO perspective, it can actually damage you. If you've got a lot of content with no links, it'll pull down rankings of stuff that you have got. And I know you guys do a lot of SEO and agencies and things. Um, yeah, it causes think, the big problems. Uh, yeah. We have a lot of very similar pieces of content too. So you mix the two and, and we got some nightmare scenarios for sure. For example, we were ranking number three, I think, for our target keyword. And uh, the Yoast SEO plugin broke and it created a brand new indexed page for every image on our article. So we had like 900 pages overnight and we just dropped out the research results. You know, because like uh, we just had too much content on there. So it just goes to show like how it affects. Um, I, I blame kind of media sites in that those guys are paid for eyeballs on adverts. And so they churn out content because they want the same person back 10 times a day. You know, but if you're a business, in reality, you need only so many conversations with someone to make a sale. So you don't need a huge volume of content. You need strategic content. You need content that sells, content that attracts, and then you can create content for systems like for a, an article that you know a lot of people link builders are going to link to and stuff like this so that you raise rankings so it's about yep. being strategic in it and understanding that you don't have to churn out a lot straight away after that um you you realize that you can spend five times as long on an article and get it better because yep. i always see it this is what blew my mind so like the direct response world the paid ad world guys will run an advert to cold audiences to a sales page and make a sale at a profit. And so they just do that all day. And it works because of the psychology of the page and the ad. Yep. It, it pulls them down, it gets a conversion. But they don't create assets. Whereas like the content guys, they wanna create assets and they don't wanna sell or do ads. I took the principles that we would do for a sales page and I put it into content. The psychology of why it works and how to pull people in and things like this. So, you know, I make a lot of mistakes and I read a lot of smart people. So I looked at like Jonah Berger, he wrote a book about um, contagious, why things go viral, yep. things like that. Like why is a society we share things and link to things and stuff. Um, I read a lot of case studies by Buzz Sumo and those guys about content and actually does well for rankings. And we found that there's like nine elements, basically that if your content has this, it's gonna do well. So. Uh, if your content, content has authority, i.e. if you're seen as an expert, uh, more than likely it's going to be shared or linked to because they see it has value, which is another one. Um, because of that, you build reciprocity, i.e. people want to pay it back. So they'll either share it with a friend or they'll link to it or buy from you. So you include these elements, but when you break it down, 
in reality, it just needs to be long form. It's not like a 300 word, you know, if, if you've ever worked in retail or in sales, it's insane that you think that you're talking to one person and you only give them three sentences and be like, yeah, I do SEO, we build links, it does this, you know, and that's it. You're not going to convert them, they don't have enough information, blah, 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 blah. So in reality, you would have this detailed conversation with them, you would move them along, and by the end of that, they would either have like a new belief or they'd be ready to, to possibly buy, right? So that's what needs to go into your content. So longer form, step-by-step, -step, high value. Um, it needs to connect emotionally as well. So it's it's not just, you can get away with just saying like, blah, 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 blah. But if you actually understand the reasons behind why people do it and you can connect with that, if you say like, you know, um, we want to build links to get traffic because then it means you don't have to be at the office till 10 o'clock every night and you can spend time with your family. Suddenly yep. that really resonates, you know, so it's just taking those principles and applying it to your content. But I, I think the coffee's finally kicked in. I do apologize. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, what's interesting, I just had an aha moment as you were walking through those things, right? In the comparison of you talking about a sales page, right? Versus organic marketers and paid versus kind of organic um I think for me, the aha moment was I create a lot of webinars, but they're, they're salesy. But at the same time, for me, I pack a lot of value in my webinars. It's always my takeaways. There's always when, when a lot of people look at my webinars, they're like, you give too much away, like pull it back just a little bit because I give them the step by step. And then I it just naturally leads into a, a very easy pitch at the end. It's like, here's how I can automate this or make it faster or more more painless for you. And I like give away the farm on the webinar, um, but I also show them that the deliverable is huge, right? And yeah. then give them a solve. So it seems like I could potentially uh, reuse a lot of those webinars as content pieces, so to speak. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Totally, because if you, I'm, I'm guessing you have some kind of structure to those webinars. Definitely. And it's normally someone has this problem and then yep. they want this result, and then I'm gonna share how you get there to that result, and then yep. there's some kind of call to action at the end. Yeah, you know? but throughout there, there's case studies and testimonials yep. and techniques, and um, I really push it far. A lot of webinars just kind of give you the tip, and it's all sales. Um, I don't, because I wanna make sure all that- hype, right? Yeah, it's all hype. I wanna make sure that, just like your, your list of the nine things, and I got them in front of me, it's all about like building value, it's useful, there, there's a story, it connects emotionally, there's tons of proof, uh, there's curiosity, there's controversy, um, and, and I want them to have a lasting memory of me. And that's how I really push these webinars. And so looking at your list of nine things, like, seems like that's like, that's huge. Yeah, it's all in there. And um, like, a lot of people think that you, you don't give things away, you kind of hold it all back. But that's crazy. No one buys a cheeseburger because they don't know what it's made of or how it's made, right? It's because yeah. they know what it is and then it's convenience and it's experience and things like that. So uh, case studies, people will do case studies wrong. A case study is designed to help someone make a buying decision. And what we're looking for is a transformation because we, we have a problem and we want to we want to change in state ourselves. We want to be from where we are now to where we want to be. So when you write a case study and it's like, we work with these people, we got X result, and that's it. It's not good enough. If you actually break down how they were before, how much their life sucked, what it is like now, and then all the steps that you took to get them there, guess what? The people who want to hire you or buy from you, they now see everything that's involved and they're like, I want that. I don't want to do it myself. I want to buy that. And that's why, like that case study that did uh, 3 million in requests, that's what it was. I could have just said that we did this and it wouldn't have worked. But because I show it all and I break it all down, it's really easy to make a buying choice then because it's like, oh yeah, I can see that they did this and when they did this, oh, that makes sense. And then we can use this. And so it follows through. So like what you're saying with those high value webinars, exactly, you could pull them out and turn them into content and um, and push them through. But it, it doesn't always have to be a sale, but there should always be a call to yeah. action. So sometimes, um, for example, in content, you have a top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel and things. And the the beauty of that is you're talking to people who are further and further removed from a buying decision. 
Yep. And so with that content, you want to go out and talk to the problem that they have, solve it, and then there's usually another problem. And when you solve that, and then there's another problem, and then you're what you're doing is you're conditioning them to be ready to buy. So at AMP right now, we have a training program called uh, the Amplify Academy. So we talk about like content writing and the promotion process and stuff like that. For me to get a customer, someone has to be keen about promotion. You know, they have to want to be promoting their content. But because it's, you know, as a search term, it only gets like 1,500 searches a month, which in content marketing is like a fraction right. of a percent. So what I need to do is I need to bring them to that point and get them ready. So we talk about why promotion is important. We show them that uh, high value content and less is, um, is easy to do if you hit these boxes. Then we show them how to uh, collect more leads with content because now it's more effective. Like our new site, it only gets like 40 visitors a day right now just because we're competing with huge sites and we're building links and building links and building links. We have paid ads running, making sales. But I think every visitor is worth like $4.50 just to the page because it converts and it does its job and things like that. So each of those pieces of content are moving someone ready to make a purchase decision, whereas if I made it straight away, it wouldn't make sense. And that's the problem, like 2% of our site traffic becomes a customer either because we don't offer anything or we offer too soon before they understand what it is or they haven't actually got to that point yet. You know, So you can actually use content to do that and move them along and get them to that point. So it doesn't always have to be, I apologize, it's dogs barking. It doesn't always have to be a sale, but there has to be something that's sold, like an aha moment. You don't have to be writing all the time. Boom. Yep. Okay, well, what can I do? Well, if you write better, it converts better. Okay, awesome. If it actually captures more leads, you can get away with less traffic before you start to promote. And then you move them along, you know? But yeah, the coffee's definitely kicked in. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, what, what have you seen works best? You talked about kind of getting the opt-in, even if you're not getting a sale and moving them down, kind of that, that value ladder or even just the, the decision ladder, right, to do business with you, really more decision ladder than value ladder. What have you seen has worked well in terms of, uh, of a way to get an opt-in? I'm sure you guys have yep. tried all kinds of different things. We have, and now we use just one thing. So um, same as a sales page, I remove all those different things. I don't want exit intent. I don't use this. I don't have sidebars. You, you you spend all this energy to get someone there. That content is designed to keep them pulled down the page and sell them on something, an idea or a concept or an offer or something. So I remove everything else. Because if you have too many options, people choose to take no option. You know, so you like I can understand a lot of people are scared that they might lose that traffic somewhere, but you're actually pushing them away because it's too much. Yep. Like if you look at Forbes right now, there's a video playing in the corner, there's a pop up, there's something else, and it's like 12% of the screen where you're actually reading the article. You know, it's an awful experience. So remove all distractions, and then we use what we call a hyper specific next step offer. So it's basically a lead magnet or a content upgrade if you've heard of those. Um, yep. I'm sure you have just your audience. Yeah. So it's a it's a bonus that is unique to that piece of content. We don't use it anywhere else. And the reason being is because it's hyper specific. It's the next thing that they want to do. So let's say I talk about how to do lead capture. My opt-in could be, hey, here's like a couple of videos of me showing you how to do this. It takes like four minutes. Because once they've read that post, they want to capture more leads. If I don't have an offer or if I have a random offer to go buy my content book or something, it doesn't align and it doesn't make sense. Whereas the next thing they want to do does. And so that's why we get such high opt-in rates. I think our lowest is 15% and our highest is 83% because it's the next thing they want to take. Yep. And then there's like some psychology around it. You know, if you get it to be a two-step opt-in, so they have to press a button and then the form appears, you'll increase lift by like 20, 30%. You know, so yep. there's different things around it, but that's all we use, man. Just that one thing. So um, that's, I've done really, really well with, with content upgrades as well. I've always had a challenge um, figuring out how to push that even just to the next thing because they're all different, 
right? Yeah. How do you connect the dots? Even if I'm not focused on a sale tomorrow, because I'm not, but just what's the next step of the journey and how do I connect that to some type of logical progression? What's your thought there? Um, so I like to do a lot of customer research. I'll sit down and talk with people and things like that and I'll look at forums and stuff. I'm quite empathetic. I try and understand why people are doing things, you know, why they're angry, why they're sad, what's the reason behind it. And then I try and map out that journey logically with those steps. It's like, what do they need to understand? Okay, what do they need to understand next? It's like, it's there's almost eight problems that are stopping someone from buying, yep. but they don't have five of them yet because they don't even understand those things exist. It's like a new problem that occurs afterwards, you know? So it's like mapping those out. And what I will do, I will interview three different people. I will interview people who don't even realize they, they they have the pain, but they don't know what the problem is yet. Yep. I'll interview people who've realized what the problem is, and then I'll interview people who've solved it, who've got past it. Because people don't always say what they mean. And if I speak to all three of them, that's a journey there from like, I don't even know why I have this problem or what it is. Now I figured out I do have a problem. And then that person who's already solved it and what life is like now. I can figure out that transformation and I can ask them about the different points, but I can also get the language that they use because that person who's solved it, the, the thing that's important to them now, guess what? There's probably the thing that actually drives them at the start, but the person at the start will give you a totally different thing. They'll say what they want traffic. Whereas in reality, you know, they wanted time with family and things like that. Yeah. So I, I just sit down and I have coffee with people yep. and we ask those questions and then we plan it out. Uh, I'll usually record it like uh, like we are now, just so I can go back again and I'll have like an aha moment. I'll be like, ah, oh, they said this and then they yep. said this and then it helps me map that process out. Yep, yeah, so we do the same thing in like strategy sessions or consultations and it's all about identifying kind of the steps of the buyer's journey so that yep. we understand what's really happening and it's always, you know, asking questions that you feel like are redundant, but, and why do you feel that way? And, and why? And you just like keep going further and further and further. Um, so, so that's beautiful. Uh, customer interviews make a lot of sense. Uh, I really like though, what you took away that we don't do is that you hit people that don't know the problem yet that are going through the problem. And then people that have made it out the other side too. That was, that was brilliant. Um, and uh, was definitely something that I can see you should be doing in, in any business, no matter if it's content or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So a lot of our customers are agencies and it's just like, man, you should be talking to, if you niche down to a vertical. So I had Josh Nelson on the podcast. He's a good friend of mine. They have a plumbing and HVAC company, right? Um, and, and all that they do is marketing for the, for those types of companies. Uh, when he started, he should have went after each of those different segments so he could understand kind of the landscape even better. And I've never heard anybody break it down like that. That was that was smart, man. Wicked takeaway. Thank you. It's so I run a lot of ads as well, and it's high competition and expensive to target people who are ready to buy. So like uh, some keywords, you know, like twenty five dollars a click and things like that. But one step removed is like four cents a click. It's also blue ocean. So people talk about a, a, like a, a content funnel. Like obviously like a funnel that you would get in the house, but it's also because like the traffic volume at each level is exponentially yeah. bigger. And if you can talk to people who have that pain in their stomach and they don't understand what's causing it, what the problem is, and lead them to understanding where the problem lies, well now they've got a pain and they understand it. And now you can help move them towards being a customer and solving that pain. You know, like a lot of companies do it. Like um makeup and things, you know, they create self-confidence issues so that then people buy, you know, they create new ways to hate yourself and things like that. <laughs> I'm not trying to manipulate that stuff, but I'm trying to understand like there's someone out there who has that pain and they don't know why. And if I can reach them, then we can help them. And they might not be a customer for like three months, but yep. we're, we're filling a much what, long, uh, deeper pipeline and bringing people in. So I'm curious um, if we look at the e-commerce example that we talked about earlier, can we break that down to what the piece of content was about? What was 
what, what was that journey that we took people through? What was the opt-in offer so that we have like a real life example that we can tie this thing to, Daniel? Yeah, so um, it, oh, it wasn't the e-com. The e-com was like a, uh, a paid ad study, but like okay. for out my content, like literally what we use now, yep. uh, I'll break down my funnel, which I don't know if it's gonna help people become yeah, customers. Some type of example I think would be really great. So people get it like concrete. I think in theory, everything makes sense and best practices. Yeah. Definitely some great takeaways, but now when we look at it in, in practice, uh, I think would be great. Okay, so like I said, we, we sell this program about how to actually improve your content and make it more effective, but then actually how to promote it, how we do everything, influences, ads, podcasts, pay, you know, all of it. Yep. People are scared by paid traffic, they're scared of outreach, they, some people don't even know that promotion is like an effective ROI and things like this. So there's a lot of things that they need to believe to be ready for that offer. So I target people who are content marketers and I explain how the first thing is, you know, if they're going insane at home and they're banging their head and the kids are asleep and they found five minutes at 10 o'clock and then they're like, oh, what should I write? I don't know. I'm going to write about like the new Batman film and what it taught me about SEO or something like that, you know. They don't have to do that. You can actually sit down and have a strategy. And when you do it, you can write less often and get traffic. And I, I, I break down all the problems that are causing them and I'm, that pain point right there. And so then my opt-in offer is, I sat with a friend, uh, Jason, who runs uh, a big Facebook group on sa like trout fishing and things, yep. salmon fishing. And when he writes an article and he release, releases it to the group, he might do, I think it's about three or four grand in sales because people read it from the group and they come across and things like that. But the, the week after, that article gets maybe two visitors a month. Yeah. That's it. You know, like, and then so he has to write something new and it takes him eight hours and then he puts it out. And so he's got all these assets that are doing nothing after that first interaction. And if Facebook closes the group or something like that, it's not going to work. We did some keyword research and like for the actual term, there's 20,000 searches a month and the number one site has four backlinks. So it's like right now you could quadruple your traffic per month just with that one article if you just did a bit of SEO. Like looking for ways that promotion is more important. Yep. And so that's what the video is. We go behind the scenes and we show that and suddenly they have this aha moment that yes, I should be focusing more on promotion. We go into the math of it as well. So now that they, th they think that, their next big problem is like, oh, well, what if my content isn't good enough? And so they get scared to actually yep. go out and promote content, which in fairness, a lot of content isn't great. You know, it doesn't hit those elements. So we explain yep. what those elements are in the next article. You know, like, so we'll get a subscriber and then uh, um, we'll send them the next article when it's ready or whatever. So the next one is, Understanding those elements that make up good content and how to get past certain writing issues and understanding the strategy behind content so that you, you know, you're not writing all the time and stuff like that. And then the opt-in offer there is you don't even have to write anything new. You can improve an old article. So we take an article that I really like and it was on Ryan Holiday's uh, site and I rewrote it. And it took it from 500 words to about two and a half thousand. And you can see, and I even break down, here I am putting authority into it. Here I'm making it step by step. Here I'm adding it value. And you can see the two articles side by side. Like I can't put it on my blog because someone else's content, you know? Yep. But they can see that and I do a video and I break it down. And it's like, you know, I'm not pitching anything. I'm just selling aha moments and moving them forward. And they can say, oh wow, I probably got an article. And when I show them, I'm like, search for an article that gets traffic, but it's not your best one, but it's maybe it's your third best one. So there's room for improvement, you know? Here's how you improve it. Here's how you work on it. Here's how you implement those things. Now your article is better. Well, guess what? We're going to take it one step further. I'm now going to show you how to create opt-ins from it because then it's going to create even more value. And in that way, the traffic you're getting now is more effective. So not only is the article doing better and it's converting better, but with an opt-in offer, it'll convert even higher. So now you've got an article that's ready to promote. So now you're ready to learn about the promotion course and things like this, you know? So I walk them through all those steps and it's all value. And the crazy thing is, is like, we've got competitors linking to that as a reference. 
and stuff and it's driving traffic and things because they they don't see what's happening you know and there's nothing sleazy about it i'm i know from personal experience that is a problem and that's a pain point and here's yep. how you get past those things and it just happens to be if you want the product at the end that's what it does and if not you can figure out things on your own or you can read our guides and stuff like that you know but hopefully that helps that helps a lot man um <laughs> That's beautiful. It is It is my webinar multiplied by two is really all that it is, right? Because I know that I only have an hour on the webinar and I know at minute 40 minutes, at, at minute 40, I got to transition into the pitch. And my my pieces are a little bit long because of uh, because I like to deliver so much content. But I know that if I just did probably twice that, um, I would have an entire funnel that I could take evergreen, so to speak. Uh, and definitely they're all, they're all really to some degree linkable assets or most of them are and would definitely fit in a progressive kind of uh, customer journey. Mm. So all we're doing is we're basically taking what is a sales page and expanding it and then breaking it down into chunks because um, like you know some sales pages are 12,000 words and they do that they set the problem and then what you want and then they work you through it and all this kind of stuff and at the end they make an offer which is great for a sales page but for a piece of content it doesn't always get linked to and yeah. so that's why we don't do it as one big piece we do it as separate pieces because then they're separate assets also I'm a real nerd man I read a lot of books on neuroscience and things like this if we take someone on a journey and it's in one experience, like people listening to this podcast now are probably not going to buy uh, my course, but if they then go in and they read other pieces of content and stuff, there's a good chance they'll convert. The reason for that is almost everything we do is based on prior experience. So systems of belief, patterns of belief and things like this. So if I try and get you to have 10 aha moments and then purchase, if the price is okay and stuff, you'll you'll do it. But if I get you to have one aha moment and then I give you a few days to kind of sink it in and now it becomes a new uh, pattern of belief, and then I give you the next one and I let it sink in and the next one, if I just made the offer straight away, you'd think of all the things in the past that uh, but you already knew and then you, you might or might not make the decision. But if I let you have time, I'm pre-framing everything and now they are hooks that you make your decision off of. I know I don't need to be writing all the time. I know my content needs to be better. I know it needs to convert better. And I know I need to promote. If they believe all those things, if I've given them time to make that new belief and then make the offer, huge. That's why I say, like, if you are going to take a webinar and break it down, you probably want to do it into multiple parts. So, like, the introduction and the pain point and your story is probably part one. The how-to and the value is probably part uh, two. Some of the value and then the call to action is probably part three, I and mean, then it takes them to an offer page or something. Well, do we interlink those? Because so that's where my complexity starts to kill me, right? So like if somebody comes in on uh, like the first step after my bio and intro, what do we do, right? Because probably my my intro is not really a linkable asset. It's not gonna rank, but that's an important part of the buyer's journey for them to understand who the heck I am. So all of our sales are done via email. Yeah. So I always want to be collecting the lead. I always want a hyper specific offer. So whatever you create. So if you have that intro section and it's not just about you, it's about them and how you are similar to them, how you've had that same problem. Definitely. And you've got past it because they need to see themselves in it. They need to see that there is something there about them and you had that same experience. Then you can have an offer like we did where I'm like, I'm trying to show you that this is a problem and here's my friend Jason and he's got that problem and we walked through and solved it and now there's social proof. And so they want to opt in and see that because it's not there. It's not in the article. The article itself is good enough, but this is the next step and it's a bonus and it's added value and it makes sense, you know, and it's not salesy either because I'm not pushing anything. Here's the thing. So we have all those articles on our site already. We wrote them like maybe uh, six months ago. 
sometimes people will opt in to like a paid ads article and there's links everywhere to all these guides and i'll see them opt into all of them within about two hours they read all that content and stuff and they'll message yep. me directly and say hey i want to buy your product the people i've sent the sales page to don't buy whereas if i give them time and then you know because we open up every three months or something if i if then they wait for that three months almost always they convert so it's like having them all interlinked where you can just move from one to the next to the next to the next will convert a really hot put buyer. Yep. If you space it out, it will turn them into a hot buyer, you know, because otherwise now they're making a decision based on, oh, this is the price. Do I need this? I've got this thing. You know, you haven't given it time to kind of stew. It's like the uh, Marvel movies. DC absolutely sucked and can't make money because they tried to include 10 years of story in two films and yeah. here's all this stuff and here's all this and there's no emotional component and there's no uh world building there's no belief systems and things like that whereas the marvel films they did one aha moment after another and so then when the uh, avengers endgame comes out everyone in the world sees it like four times you yeah. know and so imagine if they tried to launch endgame at the start no one would have watched it you know, I don't know who this is. I don't know what that is. I'm not invested in the stakes. Same kind of thing. So it's actually moving them along. So all you really need is an opt-in offer and then, I don't know, wait four or five days and then send them the next thing and then the next thing. And then you've basically yeah. got an automated email sales. Yeah, man, that's fan absolutely fantastic. So let's zoom out for a second and let's talk about retargeting. So yeah. we, we spent 40 minutes so far talking about kind of content marketing that's went by really fast. And I know that a big piece of what you do is is retargeting. So how are you applying retargeting to this content marketing process? Uh, a couple of ways, probably not how most people do it. So um, I don't like wasting anything. So I will run a retargeting ad to people who've read a piece of content and didn't opt in. So yep. let's say I have an article, people come across to it and there's like 20% opt-in as 80% of people didn't. So I will just run a basic retargeting ad for the same opt-in offer. And you'd be surprised the people who don't say yes to it at first, up to 50% of them will say yes to it afterwards. And it costs us like, I don't know, 20 cents per lead at that point. So I'm... So just for clarification, do you take them, Daniel, back to the exact same page or dedicated opt-in? I create like a squeeze page for it instead and it's just yep. there and it's on there because they've already read the article, you know, and they want the thing. Plus, once they have opted in, almost all of my opt-in pages have a link back to the original article if they want to go read it again so that they gotcha. can connect the dots between the two. Okay. Um, in terms of sales, the sales process, most people will make an offer and then they don't say anything. That's it. Like, and so it's like, hey, do you want to buy my thing? And then it's, that's it. A lot of sales are made in the follow-up. So they call it reframing, where they find objections that people have, and then they try and reframe it into like how it's how this thing actually gets past that. So good salesmen will do that. They'll try and reframe your objections that you have. Like, well, tell me what's the problem, and we'll try and fix it. Even better salespeople will pre-frame all the objections in advance to make the offer. So that's what we're doing with that content is we're pre-framing all these things. If you really wanted to, I don't do it all the time on the front, but you can actually retarget the next article to people a few days after. So when you have the email and you have an ad and they see, and it's just targeting them for that next article and that sequence, chances are really high that they're gonna click across and there's a lot of authority built and things like that. So when you're helping to move people through that funnel, you know, giving them moments and stuff and being in lots of places, so that helps get them to the point where they're ready for an offer. Because like I said, most people don't even get as far as your offer and that's why they don't buy. You know, they don't even fully understand what you're doing. On the back end, once you've made your offer, you can also reframe objections or you can stack things to it. So most people who don't buy are either, they're not interested and so that's fine. But then you've got people who are interested and forgot which is what most basic retargeting is. Hey, this thing's here, you can buy it, and you'll make a lot of sales doing that. But then you have different um, audience types. You have people who are skeptical, uh, you have people who worry, and you have people who procrastinate. So the people who are skeptical don't think the thing works. They should do if your content is good enough, but what you can do is you can show them other case studies 
uh, and if they see those case studies that actually worked, then they're going to be less skeptical because they're like, oh, actually these results do work. So I can retarget people who've seen that offer and didn't buy with these things. Yeah. People who worry about it, usually it's a self-limiting belief. Oh, it works for other people, but it doesn't work for me. So we can angle that. We can do what we call hero studies. So like maybe it's people I didn't work with directly, but it's people who followed my content and results they've got. So then it's like social proof from a third party. We can do, uh, you know, people who use our product like influencers and things like this, and it helps them get past that. And then your like the last segment are people who procrastinate. And so what we can do is we can kind of try and twist the knife and actually really talk about, you know, the main pain point that they have, you know, it's it's going to keep happening if you don't do something about it. Or you can do scarcity play like it's only open for X amount of time or I'm going to do an offer. Yeah. Most people who are targeting is here's the thing, here's a discount. But when you jump straight to the discount, yes, it helps make a decision, but it wasn't price that was the issue. It was like a self-limiting belief or uh, they didn't think the thing would actually do its job. So. Yeah. I try and create an entire sequence of ads and I try and hit those different things. Super Beautiful. nerdy, I know. No, 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 it's fantastic. We we go super deep on, on, on retargeting and most people just glaze over. Uh, so so we could talk about just retargeting forever. Like we, we, do, we do thank you videos to people that buy our stuff. We do thank you videos to people that just opt in and they're just like blown away. Uh, we so we got your average order value, right? I mean, it's crazy. Customer. We'll, we'll put a coupon and a thank you video and it'll get a 10 times return on ad spend. And it was a thank you video. It's not meant to get a return. It's like just meant to say thank you, right? Like, but people share it and they love it because it's genuine. But yeah, so we do a lot of retargeting for local businesses too. And so we run, we run offer ads, branding ads, uh, review ads, um, uh, and so we've broken them down into those different chunks. Uh, for local businesses, though, it's hard. I haven't really, it's hard, but I haven't really thought about it from like a skeptic's point of view. We also do then like monthly offers, and usually that kind of gets somebody over it. Um, but I've never thought about it from the personas. Right. So like, um, so there's a company here. I live by the beach, and so like all the companies are surf based and stuff. And there's one, I think it's called Pipe Masters, which is named after a surf competition. But basically all they do is they install outdoor showers on your house. So you can have a shower after a surf. And they have this beautiful social media profile and they show their, their jobs and stuff. So what they're doing is they're showing like proof and, and trust that the actual thing works and things like that. But they could look at it from uh, another point of view. You know, they could be targeting people who've been to the site and it could be... Um, you know, you probably would go surfing more often if you could have a quick warm shower outside in your wetsuit. We used to do it. We used to get our wetsuit on, fill it with hot water and then run down the beach because it was freezing cold, you know? And so like it increased our surfs by like 30%, you know, because I went straight in the water. By the time it's cold, we're back out again and we're back in the hot shower outside and now I can go to work and things like that. So like targeting these different things, we um we worked with a... um a paid ads company who were selling wedding rings and what they would do is if someone didn't make the purchase they would offer cheaper rings assuming that the price was the issue but it's not if if a guy you know or whoever didn't buy the ring it could be a couple of things it could be like i don't know how to figure out how to find the right size or i'm not sure how to make the right choice for this person or I like that, I want something better and I couldn't find it. So you're actually like pushing a discount, pushing a lower ticket might be the opposite reason why they didn't buy. They wanted something more expensive because the more expensive it is, the more it shows how much I love this person. Yeah. You know, so it's like you really have to think about, that's why if you do that research, you can find those angles and be like, well, why would someone be skeptical? Why would someone worry about this? You know, here's how you make sure you've got, the entire diamond ring industry, that's how it was built. Like the spending, what, two months of your paycheck? It was so someone who's super rich can buy a really expensive diamond ring, but then a guy who works like in a factory can still buy one. It won't offend the guy who's up here because now, guess what? Actually, two months of paycheck is what the baseline is. So this yep. guy's going to buy one, it's going to be huge, and this guy's going to buy one, it's going to be the best he can get. 
and so like they're conditioning these people to like buy these things without upsetting the other audience and things like that it's so smart like before that people used to wear rubies and it was all yep. content marketing and it was all like conditioning certain thought patterns you know so that you could look into that but again i nerd out on this stuff too hard do you do you do just facebook for retargeting or you do At facebook moment, and Google, yes. or you do you push it very hard not a huge amount because we're only working on that one site right now and it only gets yeah. like Organically, it only gets about 40 visitors a day. Gotcha. Also, our conversion rates are really good on the front end. So it's like often the audience is too small on the back end to retarget because they've yeah. already converted because we're only targeting people who didn't take the offer. Yeah. And then we stick, stay in Facebook. We do still have it on because we are driving cold traffic. But again, we're doing like conversion goals. So we might only have 24 people click, but then 20 of them opt in, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we're still, there's so much room to scale. We're not in other channels. Like I, we definitely want to get into AdWords and things like that. But right yeah. now I'm, I'm better off reinvesting 100% of what we turn over back into Facebook again and again and again until we hit like cap on that. And even then we can go into different markets and stuff, you know? Yeah, 100%. We've just, we found on our side that that Gmail is really good for marketers, right? Nice. Everybody uses Gmail, right? So Gmail ads and just echoing what you did on Facebook has been a huge win for us. Um, and then in-stream ads too, man, like just being able to talk and video versus just text and images is, is much like Facebook and uh, cost per view, two cents across like, you know, millions of dollars in spend a month, two cents a view is like what we're seeing in terms of YouTube. Like it's just, if they're not on Facebook, right? A lot of them are on YouTube or on Gmail. And so it's just, it's been wins for us and we can kind of just copy and paste what we're doing on Facebook to the other ones and nobody's really doing it, which is insanity. Yeah, because it, it takes that multiple touch points and it's also, the more people see you in different places, you know, the easy, like they'll have seen your advert five times and they'll be like, sixth time they're like wow this is amazing why have i never seen this before and it's like you have seen it you just don't remember it you weren't paying attention at the time I and mean, then if you are in multiple channels i can't remember i think it was salesforce they retargeted their email list when they sent an email out and the people who saw the advert and the email were like 40 percent more likely to click through and buy you know yeah. whereas the email on its own or the ad on its own like combining those two areas yeah so that's brilliant like actually advertising inside of the gmail yeah it's great um we do that with podcast guests too we'll be targeting your audience inside of gmail and i'll use my image in your image like right now what you see on screen and so it's co-branded so now they get to know me but they click because of you and then my message is always like hey i just interviewed daniel i know you guys follow him he just shared something crazy and i you know just clip a little sound bite and then i'm like you got to watch the rest of the episode and now i'm warm I'm no longer cold. Um, so that's been working really, really well. Red carpet right. effect, right? Yeah. So there's implied authority by being uh, association between two things. That's why yep. we do adverts with the influencers using it, because then it's like our product is good. You can trust the product because these guys use it. You know, yep. that's why people pay uh, celebrities and athletes to, you know, that's why they're sponsored athletes and things. Yeah, and endorsements. Yep, it's mm. the same thing. It's the same thing in the affiliate marketing world, right? The reason that it converts better is because you get their endorsement and their introduction and their blessing on the product. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm always thinking in my head, like, how do, how do I leverage someone else's audience and not be completely cold? Uh, and what are ways that I can do that at scale? That's it. Like, I'm writing a, um, I'm on kind of like a mad hook right now, and um, I'm writing a content marketing book, and the book mm. is designed actually it's designed to leverage Amazon's traffic. You know, like some people are doing it and they're doing like $90,000 in books, just a book alone to bring people in. And it's designed to uh, help people with content marketing so they're ready for our course. So like it, the exact same thing and going out there and a lot of people don't realize when you're creating content, you have content for your customer, but you also have to create content for different traffic systems. Like if you want a lot of backlinks, your customers don't have websites, they can't link to you. So you need to create content that's gonna to appeal to those people. If you wanna run paid ads to content, 
that content has to convert, you know, so you have to understand those systems that drive traffic and how best to use them. And it's kind of crazy that people don't realize like the two things. They'll either like just create content for Google and have no way of converting their audience, or they'll just create content for the customer to make a sale and then they can't get traffic in because they're not building anything that gets links and stuff, you know? You have to combine the two. That's a huge takeaway for sure. So I know that I can take what we have and I know that we can get good opt-ins and good conversions from it because we have crazy data and what we teach is next level. So that's not a problem. I guess for me, I wonder, how do we make sure that when we target like the, the stuff at the top of the funnel, the wider stuff, the stuff that is more linkable assets, the stuff that's gonna get us more of the traffic so that we can take them down that buyer's journey. Paid traffic makes a lot of sense and it's gonna be a lot cheaper, but how do we make sure that we hit kind of the right things that that will get us a win, right? That will be linkable assets and won't just kind of tank after we spend two or three months building those assets. Like that's my fear. Well, it's what most people don't have and what you need is you need that sales sequence because that becomes yeah. the backbone and then everything else ties in at some level. You know, if you're writing yep. case studies, it should link back to that offer and back and forth. If you are doing SEO content for top of funnel, at some point it should have a siloed link back to the start of that funnel so that they yep. understand, hey, you have this pain point. Because, yep. and then, you know, it, you can kind of manipulate the systems. You find a keyword that gets traffic that's not that difficult, and you write a great guide about it, and you promote it and build links. Because no one else has got a good guide about it, you create a lot of links, more than you normally would for an article. That raises every other page's rankings because it's an inverse, right? If you've got a lot of content with no links, it goes down. If you've got fewer content, but with doesn't have to be fewer, but like as long as content is on uh, links are to all your content, then everything else starts to rise up as well. So you can talk at those different things and talk about it and build links to it and pull people in. Like uh, we just did an article about paid content promotion because not a lot of people talk about it with Facebook yep. ads. It's got 75 sites linking to it, like unique do domains, you know? So like that drives the majority of our backlink profile. That's so really interesting. That, right, and that pulls people into our sales funnel and then I can create another article. A big thing that people miss is niche authority. So if you write an article, keep talking about that topic for a while. So write like five articles around it. So if you're going to talk about content promotion with paid ads, for example, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how to troubleshoot those ads. I'm going to talk about how to scale those ads. We've got a guide coming out of someone who read it and got results. People want to put labels on things. And so if they know, if you help them just figure out who you are, they're more likely to see you an authority. He's the paid promotion guy and he's got killer stuff on Facebook promotion. And then I can be an authority in the space. But if I talk, like I've done SEO, I've done influencer marketing, I've done all this other stuff. If I bounce around between those topics, I'm just another marketing blog. But if I yep. stick with that one thing, we're the expert at that thing. And once you're the expert at that thing, it's really easy to go across to an adjacent thing. Like Lewis Howes was, what was he doing? Selling webinars or teaching people how to build LinkedIn profiles yeah. at first. Then webinars, yep. then he did a podcast and now he's selling podcast training. You know, but he had to have those areas of influence before he moved on, you know? And the other big thing I took away when you were just talking was kind of hitting the sub niche and having an angle, I think is more important as long as it just applies to the general scope or the general category so that you can reach out with to a huge audience um, instead of, I don't, I don't know, like for me, the skyscraper method by Brian Dean, I love it. But in the SEO space, like our marketing space, like how do you win with something like that? I look at it and I'm like, holy shit, like that's a lot of work. But I could take a unique case study or an angle from a webinar that has to do with link building or marketing and it would still crush it because it's kind of a subcategory that probably most people aren't talking about. That's the thing as well with SEO is most people are doing retroactive stuff. So like skyscraper, find an article that does well, improve it, make your version. Why not find a piece of content that people haven't done, you know, yeah. that people actually want? Because you're talking to your audience, you know it's a topical thing that's coming up. Because you're yeah. looking in forums, you know it's a pain point that no one's talked about. Like the reason we have content promotion as our main topic is, yes, of how important I know it is 
but it's also trending upwards. So more and more people, as we get in this content glut, are looking at this. So in 10 years, it might be as big a keyword as content marketing in, on its own, you know? So we're seeing those two things. So like looking at what is needed and what's missing and then creating stuff around that. Yeah, and who, who knows? Uh, hopefully you'll be the, the brand name, right? Uh, when, when it comes to that down the road in five years, right? Like you'll be the household name in that growing industry and that growing trend because you've been the expert for so long. So yeah, I love, I love that. Ending. Yeah. It's pretty cool. We're excited for what uh, for what it can do, and we're just uh, just scaling it now as we go. Man, this has been killer. Uh, just looking at the time, man, we may have to have you come back. Uh, I like to keep these right at an hour, but we barely even touched on anything, and the time just flew by, man. I want to thank you. Um, so real quick, I guess to wrap things up, anything that anything that you think we missed. If somebody's gonna listen to this episode and they go through the hour and they're like, holy crap, is there anything that you think maybe we need to hit on real quick before we wrap it up? Well, I know um, you always ask for a book recommendation, right? And yeah. I was trying to like, uh, there's so many books, but the I would say scientific advertising, which is like okay. a really simplified version of learning direct response. Read that book and if you learn that, you'll learn why people do the things they do and how to get them to do an action how to measure that result and then you can apply it to your content to your emails to your ads to your sales page and stuff like that the more you understand your audience the easier it is to make a product that they want and and to sell it you know like it's not just because it does this thing like our sales page has changed four times same product but like understanding yep. the angle better of what the audience needs and then improving it from there so yeah, if you, I would recommend reading that book, super cheap. I think you can even get it on PDF for free now. And then understanding your audience, the more time you spend there, as crazy as those people are, you know, like the better you'll understand and the easier your job will be. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. I, I always talk about just being a curious, uh, a curious prospect, right? And that if you're interested in going into a vertical, like you should be having conversations with that niche all the time. And it doesn't matter how you get the conversation started. If you got an ask for a favor, or an introduction to somebody else, like it doesn't matter, but you should be very, very curious and you got to know them. So that book recommendation is is very timely. And I think it also ties in very well with, with what we talked about today. Uh, so thank you very, very, very much for that. Daniel, as you look at your businesses and you look at your success, is that the one book that you think that has made the biggest impact on, on your business? Not like, you know, it was great, but I didn't do anything with it. Obviously you took that book and you applied it, but I feel like there's so many books that people toss around that are like, yeah, that was a fantastic book. It's a must read. And then you look at their business and their life and they didn't apply anything from it. So that was probably the biggest one that uh, helped me understand my audience. It's weird because it's like what book at different stages in your journey. I would sure. say like the biggest one for me is a book by Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way, which is about stoicism and learning how to deal with difficult situations, but also how to deal with success. Because like at one point we were a small business and then we were like a huge business. And then, you know, we didn't always handle it well and things like that. My weight, I put on like 30 kgs, stuff like this, you know, because you're trying to do like 14 hour days and three Red Bulls and things. So reading that and helping me reset my brain. Now, like, you know, we get links by huge companies, which is great. We also get people talking smack to us in Facebook ads, which is fine. Both things I, I hold in equal regard in that it's, you know, it's cool. I can focus on the process and just keep doing the thing. So that book, he's got a third one coming out, I think called Stillness is the Key. But they're like those books that he did there about stoicism, so helpful as an entrepreneur, because sometimes, you know, we don't always have people to talk to or, yeah. you know, sometimes you can be super successful and then go batshit crazy, you know, and spend money everywhere or do something stupid, you know? Awesome, man. So we'll definitely link up to you, uh, uh, both that inbound Ascension and also Amp My Content. Uh, what, what are you most active on social-wise if somebody wants to reach out and thank you for, for coming onto the podcast? So I'm on Twitter at inbound ascend, uh, A-S-C-E-N-D. Okay. I don't push social. 
So like, it's usually, I might say on Twitter, oh, here's an article, but usually it's like, hey, look what my cat's doing. And there's a photo yeah. of him in a basket, you know? So like, I don't push it on there, but you can get me on there. You can message me, you can tag and follow and stuff. It's kind of good because we're not selling to you all the time on there, I guess. Yeah, 100%. So everybody, if you would, please take a second if you guys enjoyed today's interview. I know I enjoyed it. I'll be jumping over to Daniel's Twitter, giving him a little shout out for today, showing him some love. And I would really appreciate it if you would too. And Daniel, man, thank you so much for coming on. And and at the end of the day, man, you shared from the heart. Everything was like real actionable content. I know that you didn't hold anything back. You just came and gave, gave, gave. So if you guys are interested in, in amping up your content like I am, definitely go and, and check out Amp My Content and Inbound Ascension. Thanks so much, Daniel. I really appreciate you being here. Have a freaking awesome, awesome rest of your week. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.